Go ahead, uh, grab your Bibles, open up to uh, Genesis chapter 30. We're going to look at the second half of Genesis 30 this morning. Now, as you're there, I'm going to bring up what I assume is a kind of a painful story for us at this point, unless you're a Sox fan, in which case we pray for you in other ways. But <laughs> thinking back a couple of years now to the 2016 NLCS, it was the last game of that series, and the Cubs were up. Bottom of the ninth, one out, Dodgers are batting, and this is it. Like, if we, if we can lock this game down, we go to the World Series for the first time in 71 years. Imagine some of us remember this. It was actually right after overflow, and so a bunch of us were watching together downstairs in the youth room. You can remember this moment. So there we are, this, this tense moment. I don't handle tension well in sports. Like, in movies, I don't mind it. In sports, like, just tell me what happens. My phone buzzes. We're streaming it online, right? So my phone buzzes and tells me, game's over. They, they hit into a double play. And so all of a sudden, I'm watching this game, totally different light. In fact, I nudged Shane, I remember very distinctly, and saying, it's okay, we win. <laughs> so we were, we were all excited, right? Like just, it just changes the, the moment so completely. I wish I had that all the time, don't you? Like you just get the notification in advance, here's how this is going down. It would just be a huge relief, it would melt all that tension away, just letting me know how it's going to turn out. Not going to happen. I just want to be real clear about that. That is not going to happen in your life, not going to happen in my life because uh, we learn so much in the process of going through it. And if that happened, we wouldn't learn to trust God. Instead, we would just learn to resign ourselves to sort of an inevitable fate. So on the one hand, not going to happen for us. On the other hand, and in a much deeper sense, it's so very true for us. Like that notification's already come across on our phone with the, with the biggest stuff at least. Like we know what's gonna happen after death. That's good news, isn't it? We know how the world ends and how it will be remade. That's good news. We know that we will trade all of our pain for glory, that our mourning will be turned into joy, that every wrong will be made right. Is that enough for us to know that? I mean, if we really believed that, and I know that's the struggle, by the way, is whether or not we really believe that. In fact, I would guess there are probably even some in the room who don't necessarily believe that. Grateful that you're here, by the way, exploring this with us. But if we really did believe it, could that knowledge transform the present? Or let me ask it this way. What we're gonna look at this morning is how can we live like the future is secure? How can we live like we know that the future is secure? If we know the promises of God and believe them, should that be evident in our lifestyle? Of course, of course. And that's what we're gonna see this morning in this story from Jacob's life. So living like your future is secure means displaying grace in any relationship confidence in any injustice and diligence in any vocation. Let's look at each of those in turn. So first of all, grace in any relationship. Let me read Genesis 30, verses 25 to 33. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. Give me my wives and children for whom I have served you and I will be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And he added, Name your wages and I will pay them. Jacob said to him, You know how I have worked for you and how your livestock has fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? What shall I give you? he asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark-colored lamb, and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages. And my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages, you have paid me. Any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted or any lamb that is not dark-colored will be considered stolen. All right, pause there. Jacob, ready to leave at this point. Uh, most likely this is coming about because of the birth of Joseph, if you were here with us last week and saw all these kids being born, to his mind, because Joseph is the son of Rachel, the wife that he actually loves, this is his child of the promise. Not going to be the child of the promise, but to his mind it is, and so he's ready to go. Send me on my way. 
Also, I'm thinking, um, you, you may remember, he, he doesn't have a great relationship with his in-laws. Like, might have been that whole thing where his father-in-law gave him the wrong daughter on his wedding day. Like, you know, that little bit of treachery uh, probably soured the relationship a bit. And so he's ready to be done with him. Like, Laban's a cheat. He knows that. He's ready to move on. But he also, he also remembers the promises of God. And that's coming out in what he says to Laban. So God has promised him uh, people, possessions, and a place. Like, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Your descendants are going to outnumber the star check, right? That one's done. He's got 12 sons. His, his father, his grandfather, they each had like one, two, you know, like we're not making big progress here. 12 sons, we're starting to look like a nation. I can see how this is going to pan out. People, check. Possessions, clearly. I mean, look how uh, Laban's flocks have increased. He's doing fine there. But that place, that place is on his mind. It actually comes out in verse 25. Send me on my way so I can go back to my land, he says. The, not, not where I come from. That's there, sure. The land that God has promised me. That's the part that's still missing. It wasn't Haran that he promised me. It was, it was the place around Bethel. Let me go back there. Let me go back to where I'm from, to my land. He reminds Laban that these are his wives and children. He, he paid for them. And this is 14 years of hard labor in order to get these wives, these children. Laban's still not so sure. You're going to see that next week where he's going to go, these, these kids are mine. But uh, at, at least now, Laban seems to agree. But it's, it's those promises again that, that take center stage. Because Laban has learned uh, by divination, it seems like, which is, by the way, not a good thing, as this would sour the Israelite readers who, who first got this book. Uh, you're not supposed to do divination. You're supposed to seek the Lord directly. Uh, it's also possible to translate that phrase, though, that he has become very rich and the Lord has blessed him. And so, I, I mean, I don't want to judge him too harshly just because we, we don't know the Hebrew well enough kind of thing. But Laban learns, the important piece of all this is that Laban learns that he has gotten rich because of Jacob. So that's the important part of that sentence. And so we're seeing the fulfillment of the promises that God had made to Jacob, Isaac, Abraham before him. Those who bless you will be blessed. You will be a blessing to all nations. This is happening, right? The blessing is spreading to people around Jacob at this point. But Laban, I'm not sure that he's real concerned about the promises of God. He is commercial as ever. And so he just wants Jacob to stay because he's got the golden goose. He's not letting that goose leave. So he says, name your wages. Such an important word for Jacob, right? Wages, uh, Laban and Jacob, their relationship. Well, Jacob also knows that it's because of God that, he, that Laban has been blessed abundantly. I mean, he is steeped in the promises of God. He knows where this is coming from. But his mind is, again, he's going, I'm ready to serve my family, not Laban's family anymore. Uh, at this time, a shepherd would be paid maybe 10% of the flock or something like that. And he's going, I, I want more than wages at this point. You could imagine this dynamic today where you get a, a young VP or something like that who comes in and, and turns the company around, record profits and all of that. And that's great, but he's making the owners rich because he doesn't own stock in it. And so he get, you know, maybe gets a nice Christmas bonus or something, but he's still got wages. He doesn't have anything invested in the company. That's what Jacob is feeling here. And so I find it so interesting that Jacob is actually okay to keep going with wages and actually chooses what would seem to be lower wages. Like, just give me the, the black lambs. Lambs are typically white. That's why we talk about the black sheep of the family as the, the weird one, right? The one that sticks out because it doesn't fit with the rest of the family. And then any of the speckled goats. Goats tend to be solid and dark, but anyone that's, you know, spotted or streaked or something like that. Not going to be very many of them, so he's probably choosing less than his 10 or 20% that he should get as a, as a shepherd in this time. And what's interesting about the wages that Jacob chooses, too, is that you could check. He even says it. You can check and make sure I took what was right. You know, he just says, give me, you know, this chunk of the flock and I'll just have whatever they have. Laban's always going to wonder, have you grabbed a few more in this time? Or are you sure this was born to, to that? Let me, no, he's saying, you can look and you can see. You would worry about this with Jacob, wouldn't you? Like, the guy is good at cheating and stealing. We've seen that a few different times. And so this is, something, this is a good move that Jacob makes at this point. Also shows that he has changed. He's saying, I'm going to be above board. Like, I, you don't need to worry that I'm going to cheat you in this instance. Got to ask the question, don't we? Why would Jacob be willing to enter into this agreement? 
especially because he knows that Laban is just a good uh, cheater, deceiver as, as he is. He got burnt last. And like the last time that Laban said, name your wages, he got Leah when he wanted Rachel. So why is he going, it's fine. Yeah, here, I'm gonna name my wages again. And this time I'm gonna trust you or something. Well, Jacob's change and the, the change that's evidenced by his acting totally above board, by his saying, you're able to check my wages all the time, Jacob's change frees him to risk with Laban. And really to show grace is what I'm trying to say. God has blessed him abundantly. Twelve sons. All this uh, possessions. And if God is sovereign, well then he's got no fear that this is going to be undone. He knows he's in good hands, the very best hands. And so it allows him to risk. Allows him to risk pain or uh, betrayal, disappointment, because he's not really risking anything if God is with him, at least nothing that matters. Now look at your own life. Is this true of you? Are you living in this way, like your future is secure? Are you able to show grace to the people around you? I mean, think of the promises we have if we belong to Christ by faith. Every spiritual blessing has been given us in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us in Ephesians 1. Peter tells us we have been given everything we need for life and godliness. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, Paul tells us in Philippians. And then Romans 8 says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's pretty good. Sounds like my future is secure. By the way, those are just the first four I thought of. I didn't look these up. I didn't go to a topical Bible. I'm like, that's just, promises are on every page, right? Well, so with those promises in mind, there are people in your life like Laban, I'm sure. Like if you know people, you got somebody like this. They're, 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 they're fool me once kind of people, right? You know the whole fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And so you got that like, no way, no way. Not gonna do this with you again. I know how this story goes on. I'm not gonna do this with you again. Are you willing to risk for love because of the grace that you have experienced? You know what people I'm talking about? These are the people, you, you kinda, you flinch when you see them. Like you recoil. That's your instinct, is to back away. And the thought that's being expressed, even if it isn't verbalized, is they're not worth it. They're not worth the pain that I am risking here. Just think for a moment if Jesus had thought that way about you and me. Like he's standing there kneeling in Gethsemane. He's going, yeah. do you remember when Peter denied me? Or Judas betrayed me? James and John, I'm telling them I'm about to be killed and they're going, yeah, but can we have the right and left seats in glory? Like these guys are not worth it. These are not stick around kinds of people. Imagine if Jesus had thought that, but he doesn't. What about us? And I look, I think it's easier in this situation in some ways because Jacob is somebody who believes in the promises of God dealing with somebody who doesn't believe in the promises of God. We know that because Laban's using divination. Like this God is not his God. He is still a pagan. I mean, the, the, the cost of Christ bringing grace to us, are we willing to count that cost as we bring grace to others who still need it? To he, need to hear the good news, but... Like I said, I think that dynamic's almost easier. What about in the church? And Kyle just said it. You catch anybody else like, a little off guard where he's like, you're gonna you're, you introduce them to these people who are a bunch of sinners and rebellious people. Like these are hideous people that you're surrounded by in the church. He makes a good point, doesn't he? He then went on to say we're redeemed. That's an, also an important word. But like the, the church is filled with sinners. We are a collection of sinners like Jacob, aren't we? Like, this is a good moment for us because this is, we're being changed but slowly, slowly, painfully slowly at points. You know, risk for love or not, when it comes to the people of God, the blood-bought people of God, the bride that he loved and he came for at the cost of his life. You remember Peter at one point asked Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive? Like one or two or three or something. And Jesus, seven times 70. So I don't think it's like 490, keep tracks that you can be done with it. I think he was saying perfection times perfection. Like just keep going. And how about until you're perfect, you keep forgiving. I think that's what Jesus was trying to say. This was good info for Peter. 
after he denied Christ that third time, having messed up a few times before that too, like he gets called Satan a few times in his life. That's good information. That's why, why Christ goes out of his way to reaffirm Peter three times. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Like, I'm giving you this commission. He goes back to, are there Peters in your life now, in this church, and are you avoiding them now? Are you looking at them going, it's fine, I don't mind sitting, there's a big room we can sit together, but I'm not going to fellowship with them. I'm not going to serve them. They come into the ministry that I'm in, I'm going to find a different ministry. Because I'm not going to risk pain, betrayal again. Or do you come with this attitude that your future is secure in Christ? You can't take anything from me of what really matters so I can offer myself wholly and unreservedly to people who have hurt me before. That's living like your future is secure, putting grace on display in any relationship. Second, confidence in any injustice. Just a few verses here, and we read 24 to 26. Sorry, 34 to 36. Agreed, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. That same day, he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted, and all the speckled or spotted female goats, all that had white on them, and all the dark-colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. What do we see here? We see Jacob's changed, changing at least, but Laban hasn't. Still willing to cheat, still willing to deceive. So he goes through and removes all those spotted speckled goats and all the dark colored lambs that were supposed to be Jacob's wages, weren't they? I mean, like, Laban just agreed to this. Last paragraph. Like, the ink's still wet on the contract kind of thing. This is Leah all over again. Jacob actually risked in this moment. Jacob had to know this was a very real possibility. Why is showing grace, risking injustice? And considering, on the other hand, that Laban just wants his golden goose to stay, he's not really risking much at all. I mean, maybe he can weasel seven more years out of the guy because it can take him so long to build up a flock big enough that he might actually leave in that time. Now, I gotta say, Laban seems shrewd from a worldly perspective, but like you got any indication of who God is, this is, there's a good bit of folly involved here, isn't there? I mean, if he knows, if he's discovered by divination that this God is blessing Jacob, then like, do you want to go against him? Like, this feels dumb to me. Does it feel dumb to anyone else? Is it just me? Okay, it feels dumb to me at least. Clearly didn't learn by divination to fear Jacob's God. And here's the problem, a low view of God, you know, look through history, a low view of God undergirds every human injustice. Undergirds the willingness to perpetrate injustice. Where there's no fear of God, you can use people. Now, injustice is a, it's a, it's a good word today. Like, we like the word justice, and so if we're going to talk about something bad happening, like, injustice is a good one. It's a buzzword today. Everybody's all amped up about this, whereas that word sin, it just feels so regressive, doesn't it? Like, 1950s kind of stuff or something like that. I don't care which word you call it. It's the same issue at the core. It's the same problem at its root, a willingness to use people in order to serve yourself. That's what sin means. It's what injustice means. Now, why? Why is it that this injustice is, is here? Why is, it, why is it ever present in the world? First, there's no sense that people really matter because they're not made in the image of God. So you strip away the value of humanity when you strip away God. And then there's no fear of punishment because you've stripped away God as well. You diminish God, you diminish humanity. That's how it goes. You diminish God, you diminish humanity because you strip away what gives us value and what gives the very word justice any meaning at all. Now you got disagreements here. I can't hit it. I've hit it in lots of sermons. We can talk about it some more. Like, send me an email. You're looking at me skeptically now or something like that. Let's talk about this. Shoot me an email. I will take you out for coffee. You cannot have justice 
That word has no meaning if God does not exist. It will always only be the opinions of majority culture or perhaps just a powerful minority culture, okay? I will talk about that with you if you don't believe me. Let's have this discussion. Jacob's view of God is growing, right? He's not there yet. I don't actually think he's converted yet. We're gonna talk about that soon. But his view of God at least is growing and it allows him to love difficult people, like Laban, and to trust God, that that big and getting bigger God that he's got, even when he's facing injustice. So we see verse 36, very end of it, Jacob continues to tend Laban's flocks. Like, I'm guessing he noticed the treachery. Yesterday when I was checking these flocks, there were some dark-colored lambs and some speckled goats. They're all gone now. He's smart enough to have figured this out. It's fine. He goes on. He's like, that's cool. I'll watch these sheep instead. Like, not a big deal. So he has confidence in the promises of God. He's living like his future is secure. God has promised to prosper me. I've seen it already. Why would I doubt now? Why would I doubt now? Now, I I can't imagine that this wouldn't be equally easy for us. You heard me right. It'd be just as easy for us to do that as Jacob. Why? Because we have seen God's faithfulness and justice in greater ways than Jacob could ever have imagined. Because the supreme example of both God's faithfulness and his justice is the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. It is the greatest injustice in the history of the world because the only time that a truly innocent person suffered and it was followed by God's vindication of that man in raising him from the dead, seating him at his right hand. Injustice does not get to have the last word. I just breathe that in for a moment. Injustice does not get to have the last word and we know that. This is not a pipe dream. We know that beyond a doubt, because God is faithful, and his faithfulness is proven to us. He is faithful to the point of Christ's death, the culmination of all the promises he made to men like Jacob and all the people of God throughout history. That knowledge breeds such confidence, such confidence. In, In this life, though, justice is not assured. Justice is not guaranteed, not in this life. And there is such immense stress attached to that, isn't there? But we, we can live like justice is secure. Let me show you what I mean. And I hesitate to use this example because it's so immediate and so inflammatory. But we, it's such a good illustration, I'm going to use it still. And it's what happened in the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. Let me be clear about this now. I'm giving you zero comments about what I think about Kavanaugh as a judge, whether or not I think he was innocent or guilty of the allegations made against him. And if you think you hear any of that, what I'm saying, you're reading yourself into my comments, okay? That's not my point in talking about this here. What I want to talk about is the issue of justice that came out in this situation. What made the Kavanaugh-Ford clash so divisive in our nation, besides the fact that we're just a really divided nation anyway, is that the choice was binary. The choice is very rarely binary. Like, I don't believe that, okay? This is, I don't, I'm just, I'm gonna go off tangent. I'm not gonna do that, all right? Shh, shh. Spirits in check here. The choice was binary. There was, in this case, no third option. There's no, I'm gonna just vote to abstain kind of thing. Like, you had to almost make a choice. Because what was going there are only two options here. Either he withdraws or is withdrawn or the vote goes against him and so he, he, he's voted down or he, he gets confirmed. Like, those are the only two ways this happens. And in either case, the potential for injustice was enormous. Like either you got a guy who was innocent, who is then the victim of a massive smear campaign against him, whose reputation and life are destroyed, or you get a victim of sexual assault who does not get justice because the guy who assaulted her gets elevated to the highest court in the land. Like those are real possibilities. One of those might have gone down. Think for a moment too, only God knows. Like, given how long ago this was in the presence of alcohol, it's possible God is the only being in the universe who actually knows if there was injustice in this moment or not. Shocking in its own right. 
We have this confidence as Christians. In a world that is desperately longing for a confidence like this, no one gets away with anything. Like we talk about the good news a lot. I think we forget what makes the good news so good. This is one of the places. This is part of what makes the news. Justice is real and it will happen. No one gets away with anything. That's also really bad news, isn't it? You're not getting away with anything. I'm not getting away with anything. There will be things that people won't know about us until we stand before the judge of the universe at the end of time. There's good news there too. No one gets away with anything, but God can and will subvert injustice for his own entirely good purposes. Well, that's good news. Like, that's the cross in a nutshell, isn't it? Like I said, the greatest injustice in the world. Look what God did with it. Does that give you confidence? Never mind the fact that that also means all the injustices I've ever committed are taken care of. They were punished in Christ. So I can experience forgiveness and blessing. Instead, are you living like future justice is secure? Not that we don't work for it now. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks' time. Are you living like future justice is secure in your life and ultimately everywhere? And when you see injustice, you can plead your case before an all-knowing God and that can bring true peace no matter how it shakes out on earth. All right, Jacob's there. Flocks far away under the care of Laban's sons who don't want to lose their inheritance, so they're happy to participate in this little charade. Ironically, kind of sets up Jacob's success. And let's look at that then. This last section, diligence in any vocation. Verses 37 to 43. Jacob, however, took fresh-cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white strips on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. And he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Jacob, totally unfazed by Laban's treachery and confidence even in injustice. And so he just sets about doing what he needs to do. And there's tremendous wisdom in his approach. God's promises are not a free pass. Like, just sit back and let him do it all. God has promised Jacob prosperity, and he will prosper because God is faithful. He's going to do it. It still requires him to labor. And so he gets about doing some hard work, right? Labor he does. This is the weird part of the story. Yeah, like, you were reading the passage in advance of this morning, and you were like, quick question, Cooper. What's the deal with the peel and the branches thing? How does that make it? I don't know, okay? What do poplar, almond, plane trees have to do with this? Now, there was a superstition at the time that a strong visual image during conception would imprint on the embryo. Not a molecular biologist. We got one in the room. We can ask her later. I don't think so, okay? I'm guessing that's not how this works. Jacob is, is laboring at this point. Yes, like he's doing good work, but he's also probably trying to control the process a little bit, trying to control God's promises. Uh, it works out a little bit if you were here last week, like Rachel and her mandrakes. Like, so trying to, trying to do something a little bit uh, extra, take care of this. We've got this tendency, don't we? Right? Like we believe the promises of God, but then there's part of us that's going, you know, but just in case he's not in control, I want some guarantees. So we just did parent commissioning. Let me give you a parent example because I think this is a, a, such a, a key area where this happens. The struggle that parents have, and I'm speaking as a parent, is trying to save our kids. Right? Like I'm going to do whatever it takes to save my own children rather than trying to introduce them to the Savior. That's a world of difference, isn't it? And you know what? The indicator is prayer. That's the one that shows you if you actually trust God or if you're trusting in your methods and mandrakes and almond branches. Well, it gives me some comfort, though, the fact that Jacob still seems to be kind of like manipulating the process here because it means that God is faithful even when we're still works in progress. Thank God. 
Otherwise, we're in trouble. In fact, we're going to see these same control issues in a couple weeks when he goes back to meet his brother Esau. And he, he wrestles with God, sure, but he also is going to try and manipulate the situation and make sure it shakes out the way he wants it to shake out. So still got it. At the same time, I don't want to judge too harshly either because God is clearly behind it and Jacob knows it. In fact, he mentions the passage we'll get to next week, chapter 31, verses 11 and 12. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, here I am, and he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted, for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. So whatever his thinking is with peeling these branches, he knows that God is ultimately the one behind it. It's also possible, I think it's a little unlikely to my mind, but some commentators, I'm giving you, you know, all, all the options here. Uh, some commentators think that he's actually trying to throw Laban off the scent. So he's got these weird branches as like a decoy so that if anybody's spying on him, they'll think the branches are what's doing it because he's actually got a real, legitimate, scientific cause of success. Nahum Sarn on his commentary on this, there is a scientific basis to all of this. Monochrome hybrids, they're a single color, that's what monochrome means, but they've got the recessive gene, they got the spotted speckled you know, gene or whatever, tend to be more vigorous. It's known as heterosis, in the like, layman's term for that is hybrid vigor. And so you would actually sense which one, if you're paying real careful attention, you'd be able to tell which ones had this recessive gene. And so Jacob is a careful, attentive shepherd, may have noticed this. Maybe why he only puts the branches out at certain times, what we saw in verses 41 and 42. There you go. That's the best I can give you, all right? So if you figure it out, you let me know. Living like your future is secure, this is the takeaway part at least, doesn't produce inertia or apathy, but rather diligence in whatever vocation God gives. Whatever your vocation, your calling is at this moment, whether that's as a student, or you got a career, retirement, or you're a parent, you know, whatever the vocation is, God's promises are not license for laziness. He has given us work to do, and he expects our diligence. It is true that God does some things entirely on his own. The big one is justification. Theological term, sorry. Got to bust it out. That's when God declares us not guilty, innocent, righteous. And that is a work of God and God alone, by grace, through faith. That moment when we put our trust in Christ, our sins are wiped clean, and it was him and him alone. But once justified, God then calls us to participate in our sanctification, another theological term. So if, that, if justification is our declared righteousness, sanctification is our demonstrated righteousness. When what God said to be true of us, that we have the character of Christ, actually becomes true of us slowly but surely. And so the difference there, if you want it mapped out like in Israel's history, is the difference between the Exodus and the conquest. God brings Israel out of Egypt all by himself. Like he sends the plagues. They get to that part with the Red Sea and he's like, stand still. <laughs> the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Direct quote. Parts the Red Sea, wipes out the Egyptian army. All of God. They like, get across, they're all excited and stuff like that. And he's like, cool, I'm, I'm gonna bring you into this promised land. And they're like, we can't wait to see this. Good, put your armor on. You guys are gonna do this one. I'm going with you. It's still gonna be me. In fact, we're gonna start with Jericho because I don't want you ever to think that you're the ones doing this, but you're gonna participate in it. Like that's, the, that's justification and sanctification in a nutshell. So why Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Of all our vocation, calling, again, this is the clearest. If you are in Christ, God has called you to be holy. Are you making an effort? Is there diligence in your pursuit of holiness? Grace is opposed to earning, as Dallas Willard loves to say. It's not opposed to effort. In fact, it's cheap grace that's opposed to effort. And cheap grace is one that rests content and sees grace as a license for sin. No, knowing that God intends to make us holy, that he will sanctify us through and through so that our whole body, spirit, soul will be kept blameless the coming of Christ Jesus. He's faithful. He's going to do that. That, that. that secure future spurs diligence in our striving. In fact, I would even say that the, the fact that we know it's coming, 
that this is a, a promise that, that motivates the effort. When we take a different area, for example, it's such a spur to be diligent in evangelism knowing that God will save people, isn't it? Like if I didn't have that confidence, I'm not sure I could do it, but I know he will, and so I can step out in faith. Could God save without our help? Yeah, Paul comes to mind. I'm pretty sure that whole Christ appearing to him on the road to Damascus, like that was pretty good. Why doesn't he do that more often? Well, he wants us to participate in his good purposes. Are we diligent? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they believe unless they hear it? How will they hear unless you and I step up and get diligent in the work that God has called us to do? Even vocation itself as we normally think. We use the word vocation today, we mean career typically. Even that should be affected by our belief in God's promises. This is Paul's advice exactly. Here's Colossians 3, 22 to 25. Slaves, every time I say that word, I gotta say this, we think 19th century America is really different, not race-based, not permanent, treated way differently. So let's call it employees. It's really closer to what it is. Employees, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Like you could use Jacob as an illustration of that sermon, couldn't you? His life exactly, even the justice piece shows up. If you do wrong, like, it's gonna be made right. But what's the key piece? You work for God and not for Laban. That's what you have to remember. It's what motivates diligent work done with sincerity and reverence is the knowledge that we will receive an inheritance, again, not from Laban, but from Christ. Are you resting on your laurels in holiness, in evangelism, in your vocation? Or are you making every effort to confirm your calling, as Peter tells us to do? God's promises are unfailing. Jacob has seen many fulfilled in his life. In fact, we can see it's like built into this text. I love it. So when God was first making these promises to Jacob directly back in Genesis 28, verse 14, he says, I'm gonna make you team, T-E-E-M. I'm gonna make you team. Like, you're gonna spread out, is how it's translated there, and you're gonna cover like a good chunk of property, okay? That same word is repeated twice in our passage. Verse 30, the little you had before I came has teamed, has increased greatly, has spread out. And then there in verse 43, in this way the man grew exceedingly prosperous. He teemed, he spread out yet again. The promise was for people, prosperity, and a place. God is clearly doing all that he said he would. But what I love about this short, like totally weird little chapter that we've got here, right? It's, it's a weird story too. It's, it's, a, it's a preview of salvation history. Like, this is the story of God's great rescue plan in miniature. And you want to know where the, the next time that word teamed shows up is Exodus 1.12, when Jacob's family, those 12 sons, spread out in Egypt, multiplied. And it leads to the Exodus, right? I mean, so God's people multiply in a foreign land. That's Jacob in Haran. That's Israel in Egypt. They prosper abundantly, so much so that the ruler or owner says, no, 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 this service is too valuable for me to let go. And God protects and brings his people out just the same, right? Little event pointing to such a bigger event. Here's the thing I love. Even the Exodus is just the mini Exodus compared to the true Exodus. That, that grand event, the, the great salvation in the Old Testament still just paves the way for the grandest event. You remember that Jesus was himself called out of Egypt in his own Exodus. But what does he do? He calls and creates a people. He prospers them spiritually. And he will lead us to the true promised place, the very presence of God. This is an incredible story of God's faithfulness to his promises. Promises that he made to Adam and to Abraham and Jacob fulfilled in Christ. Have you seen them fulfilled? Turn the pages mentally of your spiritual scrapbook, the record of his promises kept to you 
And if you do that, live like that your future is secured in Christ by displaying grace in any relationship. Now look, there may be some of you in this room where you, you gotta do something with this today. Like that word this morning plunged like a dagger in your heart where you're going, I have not done that with some of the people right here in this room whom Christ purchased for himself with his blood. Display grace in any relationship. Confidence, even in justice. Confidence that remembers that newspapers are footnotes to scripture and not the other way around. That's good news. Diligence in the work that he's given us in the meantime for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, it's such good news that you are sovereign and that you are sovereignly working out your purposes in history and in our lives. Your promises are unfailing. You have never failed us. You will never fail us. We can rest secure in that. Would you help us to live with that security evident in our lives? Convict us, Lord, if there are relationships we have left untended because we don't want to risk getting hurt again, would you give us the character of Christ that is willing to risk for the sake of love and the display of grace? Would you teach us, Lord, to have confidence even in the injustice, whether it's injustice we experience or injustice that we see in this world, he will make every wrong right. Help us to work for that right in the meantime. Give us diligence in what you've called us to do, Lord. We long to serve your will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.